Can someone take us live on Diamond Club so I can tweet it? Sir, we are uh, we're live. Uh, I don't know if we're live on DiamondClub.tv. Uh, I hung out with a good friend Pete Shredder last night. Oh, uh, hold on, a good friend of who? Pete Shredder and Dan Trackenberg. Oh yeah, right on. Yeah, dude, uh, Pete's a good guy. Yeah, Pete's a really good guy. That Dan Trackenberg, I don't trust him. Nah, yeah, I think I he's know. up to something fishy. Yeah, there's something up with him. Something up. Yeah, uh, next thing you know, he's going to be directing a bad robot movie or something. Uh, in a total story totally unrelated to him, um, I know somebody who's direct working on a project at a studio involved with a major, major franchise that when they walk through the halls, they hear the swelling music. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God. That's awesome. Uh, all right, I'm going to consolidate all my Diet Cokes to one drink that has ice in it, since a lot of these are abandoned, uh, half-smoked cigarettes. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I guess you have the con for a second, if you want to keep everyone warm. And uh, I guess I'm still calling Justin. I can't seem to get a response what from him. A jerk. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here's the way it goes, folks. Just say stop. Stop. Perfect. Take a look at that card. Yep. All right. Uh, stop. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. We got it. We're watching. We're <sighs> watching. Now, I know I saw the seven of spades in my monitor here, but I don't want to go out on a limb and say that's what it is. So, I have no idea. Too easy to so, we're, uh, this is going to be exciting because now we've got uh, uh, Bryce Nesh. He's going to be uh, managing show notes and stuff and making it all official. Those of you that signed up to get on the weird list, I think everybody who's sign up for it should be getting and if you're not uh, just email me and I'll, I'll tell you how to get it um but that's been fun so like every day i've been sending out some fun weird stuff out to the weird list and sometimes it's observational sometimes it's not sometimes it's neat to take a story and then follow up on it like there was a story about millions of mummies found in egypt and it turns out they didn't find millions of mummies which is kind of a relief to me I'm really quite relieved to find out that that's not the case not too much monkey news, but you know me and monkey news, I still can't help myself. So that's been cool. But in any event, uh, the weird list is fun. I'm looking forward to, we're actually gonna have, uh, it was great to have uh, David from Open ROV, and we're gonna try to get uh, both David and the other guy that started it back here to talk a little bit more about that project and we'll give you updates on that. And coming up in another week or so soon, we gotta schedule it, it's all on us, is Chris Taylor who wrote the fantastic you know, the probably the favorite book by all of us this year or for 2014, How Star Wars Conquered the Universe. Chris Taylor uh, said that he'd be happy to come how, on the how show. Close to we, how close to that are we at this point? We're, what we need is a producer to contact him and his schedule. It. Uh, that's great. Well, luckily, uh, we have our, our Weird Things producer is on the way right now. Yeah, so that's great. I'm ex that's what makes me excited. Cause like, I don't want to make this a show that really leans too much on having guests, but when they're really awesome people, building underwater robots are writing amazing, amazing books. That's cool. Cause you know, I, I think that 
some shows they live or die by the strength of the people you bring on there. And if you bring people on where you have to pull too much out or you don't know, you're not as familiar with their stuff as you are, it can be more of a challenge. But when it's people who are doing stuff that we are just absolutely in love with, I think it makes for a great. That's always the thing that seems to seems work before. Well, and it's like uh, even if they're a dud, even if they're a piece of wood or a computer algorithm that wrote the book, the three of us can spend an hour talking right. about the you book. Just hurt my feelings. Uh, hey man, let me set levels and then we're ready to rock. We we are we missing anyone? We've got uh, just. So oh you, my god! I had him covered with my Twitter panel. <laughs> just so, <laughs> just so you guys know, uh, I've got a bit of a hard out because we have to record uh, three scam school stand ups and the sun sets at uh, five forty five. And if we don't make sunset, then we have to go downtown, and that adds another like hour and a half. So I will bug That's out very quickly. I had at Justin the end. covered with my Twitter panel. I'm like, oh, he's not there, so. Uh, okay, hang on. The this is Brian testing his levels. He's peaking at just under six. Uh, I'm Andrew Maine talking out my mouth. Talk, 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 talk to talk, talk. That's good, Justin. Check, check, check. One, two, three. One, two, three. I am talking into my mic. Great. We are ready to rock, gentlemen. Here, two seconds. Uh, can I tell you something? Yeah. Two, three days tops. Two days away, three days away from Scam School crossing over a million. Yeah, a million, dude. A million what, Brian? Um, uh, Angry Magicians edits. <laughs> the, uh, no, uh, a million subscribers, man. And Oh. I, uh, wait, what? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> That wait, is awesome. Wait for it. Yeah. Brian, uh, high five. High uh, five. Boom, 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 boom. That's fantastic, Brian. That is, that is, that is, that's utterly amazing. Uh, uh, yeah. I didn't think you could do it. So I, for one, I'm really, really amazed. This. <laughs> Me more than it's anyone. talked for years about how you are just a flash in the pan and at, at some <laughs> yeah. point, yeah. it's all going to die. Wait, <laughs> what's funny is that's been my, my, uh, you know, the assumption that I've worked under the entire time. Um, the I believe. Hold on. And it's worked for you so far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, all right. I am ready when you guys are. Do you want to? Uh, ready? Want, uh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Ready. Five, four, three, two. J J oh, I'm sorry. I was, welcome I was to Weird Thing. <laughs> a I reversal mean, a of fortune, sir. Brian Brushwood. Hey, man. Uh, I'm the one who pressed play right as you were drinking your soda. And Justin Robert Young. Hey, I'm Justin Robert Young. Wow, man, that was original. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really um, the world's funny man. I mean, to 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 his credit, he is. You know, he is the only guy with that as his tagline. You know, very few people whose names aren't Justin Robert Young come in and say, "Hey, I'm Justin Robert Young." True that. So, uh, I, I I noticed like on the Facebook some news, Justin, in your life, some like big stuff going on. Uh, maybe, maybe not this week, but like in general, in the last month, has anything huge happened? Like what? finally, yes. You visited Seattle. How was that? Yeah, I'm I'm getting engaged. Yeah. Oh wait, so wait, no, I'm not engaged. I'm getting married. Wait, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm something. Yeah, we're in the process of marriage. Well, uh, before the show, giddily. Giddily, as if he had an epiphany on the toilet, <laughs> Andrew says, it Brian. Was in my car, driving back from eating. Brian, Brian, you realize Justin's getting married, which means he's going to care a whole lot about his partner. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, he's going to have like these feelings. And, and, and it's tough. And he's like, yeah. And then Andrew says, I get to exploit those for the show. <laughs> now, now there's more, more uh, brain cells to twist with agonizing scenarios. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. It's going to be curious to see uh, how fundamentally different Brian and I are as people uh, when it comes to deciding, uh, you know, uh, whether or not we will uh, uh, save the lives or spare the horrors of our, of our significant other. I think this is going to be very telling about me. We have a baseline of a good, caring wife, or sorry, a <laughs> husband and father, and uh, then we'll see how much of a scout. Who, who knows the difference between engagement and a proposal <laughs> and if we're going to get married? Yeah. Well, and also, yeah, I think we're, we're going to we're going to find out very quickly that Brian's a better human than I am. <laughs> so 
let's start with a, a little thought experiment. And uh, there's a uh, 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 kind of an adorable time travel movie. I'll let you figure out the title as I rip it off. Sort of part of the premise. Um, Is it Time Bandits? Bit. Please say it's Time Bandits. God, I love Time Bandits. It's the best. In fact, that's my pick. We're skipping straight to picks. My pick is Time Bandits. Time Bandits forever. Oh, my God. That movie's amazing. Uh, actually, it's about time. But anyhow, here's the plan. Here's the thing. Justin, I want you to imagine yeah. that you, you're walking through your apartment one day and you open up a door. You notice if you open up this door at like 12.01 p.m., you step through it. And imagine for a moment back in maybe your junior year of college, you had like a crazy, hot, crazy girlfriend. All right. Like crazy in the bed, crazy sex, whatever. Sure. Right? Full on. Yeah. You walk through this door in your apartment. It's 12.01 p.m. here. And next thing you know, you walk back into your dorm or whatever. And there she is. It's wait, back in time. So uh, hold on. Like she left or? No, no. It, it is as if we never left. Like, it's a, like you, he back. travels back in time, back to one day, you know, back to one awesome day. Oh, so you're saying like, 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 like it's not like there's an artifact and we have to charge up the crystals. It's just literally uh, I'm in my kitchen uh, for one second. I walk through the door, except this is not the door of my apartment in Oakland. It's into the Lawrence and Hall in Syracuse University. And it is 2002. Is uh, a question is is uh, like I assume like can he feel his face and see whether or not he has he probably did have the same beard back then but like like is his body of him as a junior or is he suddenly it's a thirty? It's been a junior, but man? now he's he's got control of himself in that that point in time. And does he remember the future? Does he remember? Oh yeah, he's he's Justin now, and now he's like he's back there, man. And so, so here's the thing is like you find out you can try to change stuff really, but you're in some sort of bubble where it's really you really can't change much, but yeah. you can go back and kind of go back to that day. So, so, so you can't stay there and live your life out. No, nah, because it's like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, end of the day, you sort of you're back in your body. OK. So again, that would be the, the, the first question is just exactly how this ride works. Right. And so trying to find out. Where, you know, at, at what point do I go back? And then you can start to make the moral questions of what is appropriate for me to do in in this uh, in this this back in time form. We wrap up this podcast. You're like, well, that's a stupid story, Andrew. Thanks. I got to go. <laughs> you get up, you walk through a doorway. And next thing you know, you're back there. You're back in that day. So, all right. If if. But at some point, I have to come back to the present to to face uh, and, and understand sleep, what I when, did in the past. When you go to sleep, you wake up in the present. Okay, right, right is walking through that door. Okay. That's the key. That's the key. Because if I if I wake up and I'm back in the present, then all I am guided by is what I feel guilty doing in the past. Like let's say theoretically, if if we are looking at. Uh, you know, especially in the context of my fiance, soon to be my wife, uh, do I feel guilty for in uh, uh, it, through this wormhole banging my crazy ex girlfriend? Although then my present girlfriend, like basically living out the life that I had already lived, and uh, and playing the part of uh, as I as I go back in time, I'm the only one in that scenario that knows there's a moral conflict there. Or we'll ever know there's a moral conflict there unless for some reason the past starts to bleed back into the future when I wake up. Right. And I guess also in that moment, you know, you said that when you fall asleep, you wake up back home. But in the moment, assuming there's only one trip, unless this is a multiple trip door or something in the moment, I assume that you don't know that you're ever going back. Maybe you just walk through the door and you're like, oh, so I guess I'm suddenly a junior again. And and the last um you know, 12 years of my life was a fever dream. Well, I mean, I guess that that's, so that's my thought is that I would initially just do everything that I would want to do that would create no moral conflict for me back it, that, that I, that I did when I was a junior in college. Like I would, you know, hang out with friends that I hadn't seen in a while that have maybe through their life and business and family and having kids have, uh, you know, become different people as we all do. We all evolve. Uh, I would hang out with them and have those same experiences again. I would, uh, you know, do all the things that I fondly remember uh, of that point in my life that if 
my fiance slash future wife was watching me do that would just probably go like, oh, you, yeah, that's fun. You know, look at that. And then, I don't know, I feel like I would want to get the lay of the land before I started, like, you know, banging my crazy hot uh, then girlfriend. But I guess, I mean, isn't this in some ways a very real thing that happens to us when we have dreams of our youth? Because I noticed that uh, that I am bummed out by my dreams now because uh, there'll be there'll be scenarios where someone wants to have sex with me or whatever, and I'll say Somewhere. no. Somewhere, sometime. I'll, I'll I'll say no, and then I'll wake up and be all like, "Damn it!" <laughs> you know, well, you know? It's the like, only place I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> I know, well, right? Let's, let's here. So this is where, it, it, as all paths and weird things, it's never a straight path. And so Justin's established that that you know morally that that he would have he would not engage in be like hey listen because for him you know his his morality is something he carries with him it's not an ocean he swims through yeah so um, use that analogy as you wish <laughs> but, it's so, a, but man get that tattooed across your chest <laughs> so Brian's jumped ahead to here so what if what if there was what if you could go back but it was a day that already happened it was a day that already happened you walked through that door it was a day that happened it was like a crazy snow day crazy wild sex with this girl whatever kind of thing it was like one of those best days ever. You can't, couldn't change anything, but it just was. You got to relive it. So, uh, but is it like uh, so? I'm on rails. Like this is yep. Pirates of, of of the Caribbean. <laughs> I'm just rolling through this day, and so I'm just a spectator in my head, and I'm acting it out. But uh, it is the same reaction. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, that's just history, bro. Like you know, you want you want to go back into the the history textbooks and start yelling at uh, everybody for for doing things that might be different in the current context. You know, if we, if we want to go back, we can get on all the founding fathers about owning slaves. Okay, you, <laughs> at some point, you just got to understand that it was a different time, a different place. We were all different people. This, uh, by the way, is I believe the plot of Kurt Vonnegut's Time Quake. Where uh, did either of you guys happen to read that? the uh, The idea is is at a random time in in the early 1990s or whatever. Suddenly, every single person in the entire world snapped back 10 years in the past in their own body, but unable to change any of their own actions. They sat there as trapped prisoners, feeling every sensation, uh, uh, watching every bad decision get made. They had to re-experience every breakup and all that stuff. And one of the curious side effects is that in their own head, they, they just they just tuned out. They're just like, this is the fever dream of my life, and I'm not really a participant. I just have to watch it again, this agonizing, you know, that murder I committed, that hit and run, that, that breakup, or, you know, for, for various people. And then at the moment that time catches back up, nobody knows what to do. Everyone who is driving a car, because they're still tuned out, they've been tuned out for 10 years they just stay tuned out and then plow into a wall. And uh, uh, the lead character, uh, Kilgore Trout, walks around and he's the one that, that has the epiphany of how to phrase it to everyone, where he just goes around to all these zombified faces and he says, you've been sick, but now you're well. And he, you know, it, it becomes this mantra. It, it was a, a fascinating and terrifying uh, thought experiment. Dude, you want to, all right, now it's getting weird. Because, like, one of my college girlfriends was obsessed with Kurt Vonnegut and was the one that got me into Kurt Vonnegut. And I believe it's Timequake that references her hometown, which is why she loved that book. That's amazing. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And she's here. Back ah, ah. <laughs> so we, we've said, OK, listen, if it happened, it happened. But for you to be like, ah, you know, well, what time is it? Let me hop through that door. That OK. Oh, would oh, you do oh it? so now how many times do I want to go back and relive that that day? And does it uh, does it begin to erode my moral fiber if I'm if I'm doing it every two hours? Because the first time it was an accident. How were you to know what was behind that door? But now you've got a magic door to the past and you can go through there as much as you want. And really, how different is that than, let's say, other methods of escapist entertainment? You know, like pornography. Well, and I was thinking specifically of, you know, there are couples where uh, they're having marital difficulties and one partner or the other will escape into, you know, Facebook where they can relive all of their glory days from before the marriage, which is a, a, a minor 
you know, a minor version of that this same dilemma, right? It's like, you know, if, if you're married to this person and you're supposed to be shaping a life together, you know, does it really make sense for you to retreat and spend hours at a time, you know, reliving yeah. memories that were before this person? Or with other websites like YouTube, where they can just continue to uh, create a fan base of younger people uh, and, and eventually amass over a million followers. <laughs> Man, I'd love to be in that position, let me we'll, tell you. <laughs> we'll say that for the next topic, all right? But now, so we, we've established... You haven't given us an answer, Justin. If if I am just reliving it, and it is just a heightened version of me remembering those moments fondly, I get all right. So here's here's my question: Is do I relive it in real time, or am I am I reliving it like in a like do I blink out? For five minutes and, and wake up, or do like, am I out cat catatonically for twenty four like hours? You, you have to take the day off and say like, uh, "Peace out." I'm spending Thursday back in two thousand two. It's compressed. You're out for a few minutes or something, you know. Then really, how different is it than remembering? I mean, like, like you, we already make these decisions. You know, if, if you choose to kind of live in your own past, then that is just the slippery slope to what we're talking about. And 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 I feel like for me. I kind of find living in in the past to be kind of the the enemy of the future uh, and and the uh, almost like a, a tap out that you are not happy now and and I force myself to rethink of like well how can I make myself happier now so I don't feel like I would do it all that often however I don't think that I would find it morally reprehensible that I would go through these visceral visceral like you know uh, uh, intense no holds barred sex sessions, uh, you know, from, from 2002. All right. So I, I, I have, I have a question here. Uh, at what point do you tell your fiance that you go and how often you go? Do you tell her like the very it first would be, I, I feel like it, like it would have to be an explanation for, a, a, a change in behavior. Like if, if there was an observed change in behavior or there was a distance in our relationship that was created by it, if I could not have it just be a part of my normal personality, then I, I, I think I would be forced to, my, my, my moral code would dictate that I would have to have a conversation about it. However, if everything is just hunky dory and maybe even these releases make me a better, more attentive uh, husband or fiance, then I feel like, you know, anything goes, baby, like Club Obi-Wan. Man, that's uh that's that's crazy. Cause I'm gonna assume that you you go through this door and it's got rules like um I, I can never remember the numbers, but the Stephen King book of where there's like a doorway that goes to 1964 and he wants to pre prevent the Kennedy assassination. Have you did you guys read that? Uh, the uh, uh, he uh, uh, basically every time you go through time resets itself. So no matter how bad you screw things up in the past, you go to the present and you're like, oh, the whole world's at war now. And then you you go back through the door and everything is reset to its original timeline. Like it, it, if it's a penalty free little area, how soon until you sort of follow the dark descent of Groundhog Day and start. You know, start, you know, like I'm going to get in a bar fight. Like, you know, you're just mad. You're like, I want to hit something. Oh, but no, in, in this in this scenario, you're on rails. Like you are yeah, just. Oh, OK, all right. You're just experiencing it. All yeah. right. But it's just that one day over and over. So. Nothing is purely hypothetical here. What? Scientists have increasingly been able to locate and isolate where memories are in the brain. Oh, now, crap. a couple of years ago, MIT scientists actually created a breed of mice with optogenetic neurons. These were neurons that could actually be triggered by using light. Light would hit it, they would fire, and able to find specific locations in the brain. And what they would do is they would create like a frightening experience for a mouse, see where it took place, and later on go trigger that neuron again, and the mouse would relive that experience, which is showing us more and more how memories are localized. And there have been a lot of stories, accounts of people undergoing brain surgery, Scientist presses some part of the brain. Next thing you know, they remember eating oranges when they're six years old and being able to trigger very specific parts. And now we have magnetic stimulation, which is becoming more precise. We may very well live in a period and may see a period rather where you're going to be able to do this. We put on a helmet or do something like this and say, take me back to this period in time because we find out there's a lot more stored up there than we realize. It's just like, you know, it's, it's the indexing is the question, but computers, as they accelerate, 
you might be able to go back to all of those points in your life. So, man. Now, if I had to go to a place, and, and, and I think that's where really that, the, the morality for me becomes a thing. Because like, if, if I have to take the time out of my day to go to a place to relive this one day, and I'm continuing to relive this one happy day I had with the next girlfriend, then... Yeah, at some point, you're going to have to have that uncomfortable conversation. Like so that. imagine what this is, is like, you know, you put on this helmet. Maybe you're using it to, let's, hey man, let's, guys, like, let's all, let's go watch the first episode of Game of Thrones together. Let's relive that first experience. As you know? a together, we can all remember it at once in this visceral moment. And then, like, even though we're we're having our own experiences, when we come back, we're all together and we can. Yeah, I mean, it's a technology we're using for other stuff. You know, we can, we can relive our own. We could maybe, we could like, hey, let's go to Woodstock, see what that was like. You know, man, it smells funny. So it could be these things. It could be a device we use for a lot of things, but like the internet, you know, one of the applications is, is. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll tell you what's weird for me, and, and this is a real thing, and, and this is the first thing that pops in my mind. I'm assuming that in this future version of the same technology, that at this point we have the ability to to accurate, accurately record the states of enough neurons to uh, to preserve the true memory because you've read the studies that say that the more every time you remember a memory you alter tiny details you sort of rewrite oh, over sure, it right for sure for sure and and, so, and what, but what might be interesting is that we might again it, it and it's how the indexing works too the 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 the, the real visceral experiences what I recorded might still be there and it might be layers of stuff on top of it. Uh, we don't know, but yeah, we absolutely overwrite confabulation, all this, but, but I'm going to, I'm going to take it out of the corner that, here. That, 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 that's fascinating though, that it, it, it's your brain's middleman that's screwing up the details. Like, like somewhere yeah. that memory lives pristine and it is the, the fetching of it for you. Well, that, that is where, where the queering up. Can, can I tell you like, like, Personally, there's there's entire swatches of my life that I intentionally just don't look back on because they're so precious to me that I don't want to corrupt them by remembering them. And uh, the weirdest thing I ever heard anybody I, say. No, this is this is true because I know at some point I'm going to run across a Facebook post of somebody who I haven't spoken to in in 15 years, and a flood of memories will come pouring in, and they will be true memories, and that will be the last time I ever get to experience them uncorrupted. That is. Fascinating point of view, Brian. I, 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 it's, it's weird and dumb, and also it's like there's. there's I'm, I'm not, not saying it's dumb. Like, I'm I, not saying I have to think about this, Brian. I mean, it's no. like I, I Wait, sorry, I, I, I don't think I, I, I fully digested that. So you don't want to remember things because you are afraid that once they are remembered in that in that one big visceral moment, you'll never have that visceral moment again. All of just like I have. I have nostalgia bombs uh, all over this place. Uh, I have trunks filled with correspondence from uh, from elementary school up through high school. I have breakup letters. I have all of this stuff. Uh, and I, I don't look at them because they are wrapped presents of my past. And when this is a door that I get to open and I know that the moment I read it, I will have a flood of memories. And the moment I have that flood, it will be the last time I get the true version of, of my current memory state of those experiences. Every time it happens from then on, it is colored by the last remembering and the current state I'm in. And, uh, and they're all wrong and lies. Once you step foot in the Ministry of Magic, you can never go back again. I, I mean, that's just it, right? And so I want to keep them wrapped presents. I mean, let me open those when I'm 68, you know? Let me, let me open those when, when, when people are gone and I want to, to relive it or whatever. It's uh, uh, meanwhile, there's there's so much life to be lived and so much money to be made by 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 shaping your your new uh, and I, I say money. It's like, you know, that's that's my go to phrase is that don't make no money. But it's like, you know, there, 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 there there's there's no money in the past, but there is this painfully sweet nostalgia. And again, you only get to open it once. That's that's the thing. So I, what if, though, you like what if that? loses potency over time that that for whatever reason that there are certain connections that you have to your teenage self that are more alive when you are in your late 30s than when you are in your late 60s and you are Ooh, this is good this is the question of which is it better to do to keep the memory alive uh by turning it into 
sort of a robot version of itself that's been molded over time and becomes a really great story that didn't actually happen in that order? Or do you, or is it better to uh, to to preserve it honestly? That's that's a very interesting idea. I don't know. I want to throw an ethical curve here. Okay. And and I, I want to revisit this idea, Brian, because I want to do some I want to do, I want to I want to do a little more research into you know, because the thing we're both familiar with is is we're all familiar with is how people will reform stuff and in, in magic. Memory, you yeah. see this all the time. People don't recall thirty seconds later what happened, and they create they construct a thing that did not happen. So you have this ability, put this thing on your head, and you can revisit. You can go back to like, oh yeah, that crazy time, the time we all we all went to SpaceX, you know, all this sort of time, right? Ah, let me go back and visit. Oh yeah, that that really crazy college girlfriend, right? So that we're all we're all okay with that, right? Sure. Yeah. Oh, let me go back and visit that really, really hot high school girlfriend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hot kitty porn because it's you. <laughs> wow, that first kiss, that first sexual experience. Because uh, an awful lot of 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 us have sexual experiences uh, before the the state sponsored uh, eight, number eighteen years of age. Uh, wow. Well, luckily, I don't really have many that I would like to remember pre-18. <laughs> uh, they were they were certainly not uh, things that I would be very excited to to roll back through. But I, I, I understand the ethical and moral conundrum there. Uh, I guess really there is just the question of if it's in your own memory. It's already a part of you. So think about this, right? I, I, I guess that's, that's one thing. Like, like yes, it's 100% legal for you to do it. However, we're talking about this. This is technology-assisted, which means programs need to be written and uh, artificial in- intelligent um, systems need to reconstruct and preserve these memories. When somebody types in, access this memory of when I was 12 and did my first strip poker game with Susie. Um, at that point, is that the same as saying, show me a picture of a naked 12 year old? And, and, and even more so if, as Andrew said, you could meet some, you know, don't drag some- my name into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, just you, you, you introduced the idea that we could go revisit Woodstock. Let's say you meet some dude at Burning Man who was at Woodstock. And, and meanwhile, there's a tent where people are teaching you how to, you know, tie the devil's knot and, and making dark and stormies because it's Burning Man. And then you get handed a plastic lightsaber and a helmet gets on your head. And now you're able to share someone's memories. And this dude is remembering Woodstock. Let's say the next person is remembering the first time that he had sex at 14. Right. Now it is not your memory. You are watching somebody else's memory and it's the guy. So the girl who is involved in it, let's assume in our heteronormative culture that it is a guy and a girl, that they have no consent over a pornographic act that they did under age being broadcast into your mind. Ah, uh, man, this is a whole future where I could see like a like a like a dark net of peer to peer memory trading, an illegal memory trade. Can you imagine that? Or it's like you know there there'd be some like a Reddit of memories where they're you know like uh, oh we downloaded this mass murderer's memories. Wait, you haven't lived until you've experienced. Uh, I don't even want to graphically describe whatever it is, but uh, wow, wow, that's a fascinating idea. And then what? Yeah, I, Ted Bundy was a murderer. Well, and then you get into the weird thing of like, what about the trade of artificial memories? What if somebody starts selling manufacturer? Like, don't worry, nobody actually did this, but here's a memory we wrote as if they did, and you can experience it. Well, I mean, certainly it, it would create a, a genre of fiction, no doubt. You know, in, in the same way that reality television and and home video kind of created the found footage genre. Now that we had a language for it, but let me ask you this: Is the person who dials up the machine? to target uh, a certain memory, are they culpable for what comes through it? I mean, I would say they're equally as culpable. Like, you... I I assume... Uh, hmm, man, especially pre-Google, uh, internet searches were really tricky, and sometimes you would run across horrific shit you didn't mean to see, right? Um, 
the question is, is do you keep watching, right? That's where the ethical place is. Well, but not, no, but because Google, uh, you know, and this is what happened with, with YouTube. YouTube, as it was burgeoning and exploding in popularity uh, on the back of copyrighted content, uh, YouTube skated by way of, oh, we're safe harbor. Like, we don't watch what comes in, you know, so if you want to report what's getting uploaded, we'll, we'll take action past there. But, like, we, we, you can't just sue us for some rando uploading something. So I would feel like, you would kind of have to have the same thing if you're operating this machine where it's just like, hey, listen, we'll target memories for you 18 and, and under, right? But it is up to you to decide which memories they are and whether or not they are illegal. Well, and think about this, because in many ways, the artificial memories scenario is something that's already happening. We, we download artificial memories uh, of murdering people all the time. And it's called Grand Theft Auto, uh, where it's like you yeah. get yeah, this. So like the artificial thing is like that's a degree of what we have. I'm like I'm getting like if it's a thing that happened and you just pressing a button to trigger this thing that's. Yeah, but I mean I don't see how it does because people have hijacked planes, people have run over people in the streets. Like uh, I mean the fact that 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 the simulation I'm playing is not exactly that guy doesn't necessarily change. I mean does it or does it? Does it's like oh. no 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 this is made of that actual. It's, 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 well because because. We are assuming, and that's why I think we, we do kind of have to, there are two sort of different conversations. Yeah. Uh, you know, because once we get into, you know, the, now, now it becomes art if it's fake. Like, if, if it is, and, and not to say that it's not art, that, that these things happened and it is real, but like, uh, there, there I mean, is something that you just can't get around. Uh, I mean, in like if you if it's somebody else that doesn't consent to having this true first person account of something that they did in graphic visual and audio detail. I mean, I think I think it is art either way, because uh, we we could certainly say like the GTA simulation is art, but also it's definitely art that there exists this this performance artist named Stonehenge who gives performance art pieces in which everybody gathers around and watches him amputate bits of his fingers at a time. He's kept on doing it till he's down to stumps, basically. Um, I mean, that's art, but also, should it be legal? Or, or, or what? What is the the but ethical? Then, he's doing that to himself. Yeah. What I think we are, we I mean, when we get into the the questionable, you know, uh, sexual memories realm, is this is these are other people, people who likely still exist. And now here's another element of that. Is it different if the other person in that sexual memory is still with us? Oof. Like, if, if, if they can have their reputation impugned by broadcasting a personal memory of them, and let, let's even say that this is beyond the, the kitty porn element of it, but this is like something that uh, that, that hot, uh, you know, uh, that, that hot crazy girlfriend of mine in 2003 is now... Uh, a, a staffer for a state senator and is contemplating office uh, for herself is is that is it different if she is there to, living? To be honest, it you feels die three years later, and now it's like, yeah, it might be gross of me to do it, but at least it's not ruining somebody else's life. Well, we're kind we're kind of seeing some of that happen now because what I think will happen is as the technology emerges, there'll be a sea change in expectations. For example, uh, 10 years ago, leaked photos of, of, you know, a senator drunk at a party or whatever would be scandalous and a big deal. And nowadays we live in a sort of warts and all society where everyone expects that there's going to be, you know, uh, uh, someone doing a line of cocaine photo here and there showing up. At a revision three party. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Whilst talking about how much he loves his effing wife, Bonnie. <laughs> um, I think one thing will happen, what's going to happen there too, is it's becoming so much easier to manufacture fakes <clears throat> that you're going to get to a point where you won't, you won't know if it's real or not. And it'll be like, maybe, maybe not. But I, you know, I've already seen all the photos I can imagine, you know, of my favorite actress doing things because somebody or videos even, you know, the ability to replace heads and stuff. So let's, let's change topic now if we can. Okay. So, imagine if you are, imagine if you will, you're a personality who has a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. on the verge of passing a million subscribers. Right. Quite a milestone, yeah. That's an amazing milestone. Um, Big time. You know what? Uh, I'm checking right now, and it looks as though uh, fewer than a thousand channels have ever crossed that milestone. It looks like, uh, as of right now, 
Only 974 channels in the history of the world. I've never crossed that milestone. Brian, who, who would be a new channel to be able to cross that very soon? Uh, looks like uh, So Close to Toast just did, and Made You Look is about to. And uh, uh. Oh, wait, there's somebody behind there. I didn't know it was only two under. I'm third in line. Like, I've sat there with my ticket. Scam School is third in line to cross over. That's crazy. So Brian, Brian is only 3,500 away from having a million subscribers. If you go to youtube.com slash scam school subscribe we can put them over the top faster than possible brian is the point to pass a million subscribers a million subscribers how you know how much that is that's, that's like that, more than watch that's most. a that's a platinum selling record gold records and not that i'm obsessively checking all these stats <laughs> a gold record sells five hundred thousand copies a platinum selling record sells a million this is the rough equivalent of that by the that's way you're ahead of jason mraz which i am positive my fake crazy ex-girlfriend uh, from that last scenario would be a huge fan of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait in line, Jason Mraz. You can cross after me, all right? So you're passing, you're, you're already way past like MSNBC viewership numbers. Oh, wow. That's an amazing achievement. So, sir, bravo. Uh, thank you. That's very kind. I, was, I wasn't fishing for a compliment, by the way. I, oh. it's, it's just something I've been watching on the periphery, and it's like all of a sudden like, oh, my God, it's happening. Well, you know, Brian. Very definition of periphery, Brian. Yeah. If, if, if by, by periphery you mean sitting with two <laughs> eyes focused on the computer and having all of your meals delivered uh, to you as you steadily watch the count grow up. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, Brian, uh, brings me to a new topic. Uh oh. You said watching. You ever wonder who's watching? Ah, uh, man. It's. Uh... I, I can look at the demographics. It's mostly boys. I can tell you that much. It's like 90% male uh, we skew. Well, there's, a very new, there's a very interesting research paper that just came out, and it talks about another audience that could be watching these channels, and particularly stuff that you do. Robots, Brian. Oh, doggone it. This is uh, you're, you're, you're this? killing my party. No, I'm. I'm now I don't, I just I don't mean like little robots. click robots. I mean, there are some researchers, University of Maryland and the Australian Research Center, NICTA, have published a paper on their achievement. And what they did is they have actual mechanical robots plugged into a system that watches YouTube cooking channels, and the robot is able to watch where the hands go and what the hands do, and then replicate that. They've had us watch, you know, dozens of YouTube videos, and it's able to learn by watching the video to do these things. Holy cow. I, I, I read a similar thing saying that they could, um, uh, uh, similar robots could watch a cat video and have like a 60% chance of correctly identifying what was and wasn't a cat. And, and we've gone to this point where it's not just recognition, it's the idea of, which is still less than your two-year-old, you know. Your yeah. your child, youngest? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, she, she just turned two last month. Two. Yeah. All right, good. But I got that right. Well uh, done. Almost. Uh, so, you know, she's still better than, you know, the most powerful computer in the world is only 66% accurate. She's probably 100 um, identifying cats. But anyhow, but now you have robots that are able to watch people do things. So you can have a robot watching Scam School, give it a deck of cards, and then write angry letters saying that you're exposing magic. <laughs> <laughs> you are ruining magic. <laughs> when I was but a calculator. I turn it and think. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, I'll tell you what this reminds me of. is it, aren't, aren't there uh, sports writer robots, Justin, that, that, that look at the incoming stats? Like they see the raw numbers come in and they sort of, you know, up on, on the fly, write up a blog post about what's happening to automatically update. Uh, I I don't know. Oh, have you not have you not heard of this? I mean, I'll... there's the Quake Bot for LA Times, which writes earthquake reports. Oh wow! Uh, uh, I I know that it would probably be uh, indistinguishable from most uh, game <laughs> app uh, sports writing. Yeah, look at this. Uh, big swing. Robot sports writer outperforms human is an NPR story, uh, and uh, that's amazing. So they got they got one that uh, that that more people like the writing of the robot than the human being. 
there's uh and let's be honest that's what many blogs really do is they just repurpose what other people are saying anyway so oh, sure echo chamber but, echo chamber yeah so like la times uses what's called quakebot and so what it does is as soon as there's an earthquake it publishes it and it says there was another recent earthquake blah 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 so it's automated warning you know it's 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 fascinating and it's kind of it's a very interesting area but but you have robots watching and doing stuff and you know, Brian, is the next version of Scam School just going to be a robot that's inventing magic tricks? Uh, probably. Uh, they probably do. Uh, they, they can read manuscripts from 1906 and try to figure out how to repurpose it with beer coasters and a piece of string. Then, then you tell me what you got then, robot. Uh, yeah, no, I totally believe it. You know, this is we, we talked before about that wonderful Wired article where, t where it talked about the cycle of acceptance, where it's like, you know, first deny that a robot can do your job, then admit it can help, but it, but there's things it can't do. Then admit can it can also do those things. Uh, then admit that you're glad that it's doing all the parts you didn't like, and now you get to focus on running the robot, and then uh, uh, then get ready for the robot to replace your new job. I'm okay with that, man. It's like all that does is create abundance and allow us to to do more of the of the like. I I think I'm at the point now where I have a thought. Like just then, when you were like talking about Quake Bottom, like let me look it up. And my hands went to the keyboard, and I was so mad because in that moment I knew what I wanted. I wanted Quake Bot to be up there, and I was like, oh, but I gotta type all these letters and then hit enter and then wait the four milliseconds for it to come up or whatever. Like we think so fast, uh, even even when we stumble on a name, I want a robot so fast that it instantly whispers into my mind the name that I'm trying to access at that moment. Like I was listening to uh, Penn Sunday School, and they were trying to access the name of Alex Jones, and it was like 20 seconds of dead stammer air and I was like it's Alex Jones guys it's Alex Jones it's Alex Jones is who you're trying to conjure and then they finally did and I was like uh, I'm just ready for robots to correct all of our stupid flaws and make I, all of us awesome. I would love a Google watch that listens into conversations and when names come up it pops up like Wikipedia entries and stuff yes absolutely That'd just be... just a constant feed or just something that you could like just pull up that live feed of it. it it'd be his words come up or whatever like like last night i was talking to somebody and we're trying to remember james mcavoy's name yeah and we're like oh you know play professor x we're like oh uh patrick stewart like no 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 the new professor x you know and then you know was in the dune like and then it, it's remembered you know james mcavoy but it's like it could be like those sort of triggers i mean that, that's wrap the your mind around like, this is you know there's always that gap because what'll happen is is you'll be thrilled once that comes out in the next 10 years and you're so thrilled that you've cut you know your stammering accessing time in half but then you'll be mad like oh i know the answer's on my risk but i gotta look all the way down and i have to read and take myself out of the moment why can't it just project that or take over my mouth for a second to say that name or just appear in my head. At some point, it will. You know, at some point, and that that'll be that. That's going to be one of the first leaps to when we decide to integrate our consciousness with a digital version. Is the idea, but it's not just we upload; it's side loading. Is that more and more of what we do is we offset or offload some of the processes that way. By the well, way, also like once it becomes more signal than noise, right? Or or even like we culturally are able to or, or come up with with parsing what that information is like now like i can in my head right now contextualize when i would want to look down at just something that listened to my conversations and brought up wikipedia entries on everything like i feel like i would know soft spots where i'd be like oh, okay yeah but like with like google glass one of the biggest problems i i, I had with that user interface is that it like it was really great at bringing me information it was not great at learning what was the best information and it was hard to edit uh, the, the stuff that I really wanted because very often I don't know it, it, it is things in that th there are things in that context that I would find I would like if it were smarter and more adaptable uh, as a smart as a, a more robust user experience man I feel like these are just early days conversations this is the equivalent of us griping in the early 1990s about our 56k dial-up modems and wouldn't it be great if somehow we could access things whatever and here we are you know only 20 years later and uh, you know we got gigabit connections to the to the internet. And they're super fast. Uh, like I think that's about the same size of gap between what we're able to do with searches on the fly. I think you know 20 years from now we'll definitely have that. It'll fully contextualize. It'll be listening to what you say and it will serve it up to you immediately. And then we'll be griping about how it's not in our brains instantly. We're always gonna have something to gripe about, but it's it's that and a big you know the magic word singularity here, folks is. We 
we have this idea of what we think it'll look like, but there's this point at which we have no idea what it'll look like. You know, and that, that can't we, we, know, right? Like by definition, once we get to that, uh, once once the ideas start getting generated by the machines, you know, we we can't project that far because they'll come up with innovative, efficient solutions that that you know, by definition, we can't uh, figure out. And with our crude primate brains. Gentlemen, speaking of crude primate brains. Yep. Is it time for picks? Uh, well, first off, let's go ahead and remind everybody that patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support the show. Uh, we have officially uh, hired, we hired last week on air, our, uh, our, our new producer, Bryce Castillo, uh, Neshcom. Uh, he is going to be coming on and taking on a lot of the uh, work that really is going to make this show all the better, in, uh, including finding new ways that we can make this place better. So uh, head on over, and uh, if you want to support the show, then then go to weirdthings.com, or sorry, patreon.com slash weirdthings, and uh, we will be continuing to evolve and bring this show to yet more levels of awesomeness. By the way, we continue to see all of those patrons uh, start trickle in. We can't thank you guys enough. Uh, I get all the the email alerts whenever a new person joins, so I love looking down and seeing that they're joining the Weird T Things team. We're creeping up on 400 patrons, doing almost two-thirds of a way to our goal of $1,000 an episode, enough to uh, get a little bit of scratch for the three of us and uh, cover a producer and special projects as well. Gentlemen. Yeah. Is it time for us to do picks? Yep. <laughs> I will go first. Um, this is a book that I've only perused, but I've read some of the stuff online. And uh, it's selling crazy, crazy, crazy well. It does not need our help, but I'm happy to help it out anyways. Randall Monroe's What If, right? He's the creator of the XKCD comic, and he also loves to explain things. And uh, he's got these wonderful explanations like, you know, people would ask him random questions. You know, if my printer could literally print out money, would it have a big effect on the world? And he goes into breakdown. How much money could your printer print? What would be the economic impact of that? Things like he's, uh, I don't know if it's in here, but like what would happen if, you know, I put a you know ball of water the size of the earth into the sun? You know, would it put it out? And so a lot of crazy, weird questions. And, you know, it's just a fun way to see how he breaks some stuff down. I think he's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh Teacher, wonderful ability to explain things. Yeah. How high can a human throw things? And so this book I highly recommend called What If. It's just fun to pick it up and just look at sort of random stuff. You know, the cover of it is a Tyrannosaurus being thrown into a Sarlacc pit. So, you know, he's one of our people. You had me at Tyrannosaurus in a Sarlacc pit. <laughs> is there is is this all just words? Is there an audiobook version or is there pictures? There is an of... audiobook version, but what and it seems to have good reviews, but he does things that are so visual. Yeah. Uh, uh, so he includes a bunch of like XKCD. You know how that feels, he includes a bunch of XKCD style comics in there, I assume. Yeah, yeah, plenty of that. So anyhow, that is my pick. I just I love I love people explaining things. Uh I don't I don't have a very original pick, but it's something that um I'm really excited to share with uh, my my kids that uh, and I'm surprised that that in some ways they're too young for it because there's moments I cringe and in other ways it's just right because the pacing of it is uh, a little bit slower than most other things that you would see if we're, were to come out today. But I introduced my kids. We watched the uh, pilot for Futurama. Futurama's on Netflix, and it just popped up randomly, and I clicked it for Josie, who's seven years old. Uh, and, you know, Josie is the less affected by, by violent imagery, and, um, uh, you know, she's, she's a little more stoic on her content. She really enjoyed watching the PG-13 Godzilla. Uh, uh, Penelope, however, is highly attracted to the comedy and the fact that they set up running gags and that there's a sort of a more leisurely pace as, as each little self-contained. They don't mind having the whole joke being, yeah, we're still going on this. Uh, and uh, between the two, they're really uh, enjoying it. You know, Penny's 10, Josie's 7. So the only thing I have to bristle at is when they keep, you know, they fall in love with using the word ass or, you know, and uh, there's a few awkward conversations, you know, when they, when they, uh, you know, make a, make a gay joke or whatever. And the kids just, you know, aren't old enough that they have any interest of, in, in that world. And so, you know, when they, when, it comes to that moment. I'll be happy to have the conversation with them, but it's always like, Oh, are they going to ask? Nope. They don't, they don't really care. All right. Get it. And, uh, at any rate, it's, it's really go back. It's really awesome to go back and realize 
how deeply that first season affected me 15 years ago, man, 16 years ago. Like I still knew the setup that you hear the setup for the gag and you know, the payoff where it's like, you start singing the, the full whalers on the moon song. Uh, and, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's great. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, uh, really enjoying that, that trip down memory lane. I, I, I still remember viscerally when that show first debuted and, and the idea of, you know, the, the concept of like the Simpsons kind of hitting its, its creative peak and yet continuing to go was, was sort of in, in the culture at that point. And this was like, what if we got to restart the Simpsons? Like that was this, like this idea that, which is like a really creatively unfair mantle to put on any kind of new show to just be like, Hey, be like the most creatively uh, lauded, uh, successful cartoon of all time uh, and go. Uh, although, you know, it, it really did uh, succeed. I, I, I'd be really curious to rewatch that first season because it's been so long since I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, it holds up, man. Holds up. The pacing is, you know, it's a little bit um, uh, older fashioned, which is a weird thing to say about something that had a long and storied, what, 12 year run. Uh, but uh, and it's also awesome to so often when it comes to cartoons, you see massive swings in the various voices. Uh, but of course, because they're all Billy West. You, you feel very just everybody like, well, that's a little different than I remember Zoidberg sounding in most of the series. You can tell he's kind of fi uh, finding his, his footing on Fine. that voice. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, uh, uh, Brian, unlike you, I'm going to uh, have a very, a two extraordinarily groundbreakingly original picks, the likes of which no one has ever heard of. Super excited. Uh First, I randomly found, with no assistance, uh, Alex Winter's documentary downloaded about Napster, uh, which, in all truth, Andrew told me to watch, uh, and uh, was amazing. If you haven't seen it, uh, it that is Alex Winter as, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Bill and Ted's fame. Uh, but it Wait, is really? A, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, Director a, of the a, Dark Backward as well. What was that? Director of the Dark Backward. Yes. Wait, is this, it looks as though it's totally free right now on AOL. Is that right? Uh, on Netflix, too. Know, maybe. Yeah. All, all right. Right on. That's awesome. I saw it on, yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw it on Netflix. If it's free, then that's rad. Uh, you should watch it, no matter how uh, you can get it, uh, as long as it's legally available. Although, those are the questions that are really at the heart of the documentary. And, and it's, uh, I think it does about as good, I would have liked to have seen only because I'm less familiar with their side of the story. Uh, the, the, the documentary does a good, a serviceable enough job uh, of getting inside the RAAA and the, the label heads at the point of impact when Napster uh, really hit and, and, and became, uh, became big. And they, Hillary Rosen describes uh, of, of the RAA describes this meeting of all the, the heads of the record companies who hated, all hated each other for, for various Oh, other because they've spent the last forever competing with each other and cutthroating. And yeah, and uh, th that she has Napster open on a computer and just has each of them name a song. And she just types in the song and boom, it's there. And, and uh, it, was, it was informative in seeing where you know, how they looked at that problem. And, and they're looking at this as if it's a, a, a warehouse somewhere where they have all these songs and they are bootlegging and, and, and uh, distributing it because that was how they solved privacy issues in the past. You know, that was what the, the piracy fight for the RIA and the labels had been uh, up till then. And if we are going to give a, a mulligan for you know the the Napster guys being maybe a little willfully uh, uh, ignorant in terms of of uh, you know what what they were and how they wanted to fight their battles and uh, they certainly inside of Napster they they very much second guessed their own strategy on on how they went about explaining what they did. Uh, then I almost feel like we need to at least not to sympathize with the RAA and the label companies, but like at least understand. Where, where their positions uh, were and how much we can all understand. It was just a flashpoint of, uh, you know, for, for all of, of culture and where digital culture and, and uh, where what we had understood it to be kind of collided. So 
uh, it was good. It was it was very well done, and uh, and and I encourage everybody to watch it. Man, I'll definitely have to watch that. Um, is is it is it all sympathetic to the RIA, or is it or is it just? No, 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 no. no. This is a very small part of it, but it's just like really. I mean, I've you know obviously I've grown up you know uh, you know using using Napster and reading about Napster and understanding you know a, a little bit more about the Napster side. It's not like the RIA has run out or people have been really excited to hear you know the the the, the, the Death Star opinion about why the Galactic Empire needed to be regulated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's much more, you know, the point of view of Sean Fanning and Parker about that, but but trying to kind of go into and sort of show that other side. I mean, I think that uh, my my criticism was that there was some Napster shenanigans that were not covered that would have kind of made their, hey, we didn't know kind of case even less, but I thought it was a very, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly, though. Right on. Uh, so. if, if there's time to squeeze in one more pick, uh, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Patrick DeLahanty and the, the, the throng of others uh, who suggested that we pick up uh, uh, the Lego Marvel superheroes uh, on the PlayStation 4. Um, it's so great, and it's so awesome just to see, like, uh, especially for my kids. You know, Penny has a... I got her a subscription to Marvel Digital Unlimited, and so she's familiar with, you know, a few branches of the Marvel tree, but to have her sort of understand you know, why Dr. Strange is rad or, or what, you know, they, they keep calling him rock guy. And I'm like, his name's the thing. Why are you not reading <laughs> fantastic four? You know, <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. It was really a delightful time and it's a well-crafted game. Cool. Uh, and I would like to, uh, again, extend my super original uh, pick streak by uh, recommending uh, this book by uh, Andy Weir, the Martian. Oh, are you in? How far in are you? Uh, I'm, I got like three hours left. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So, so what, what is the, what is, what is the hook that keeps drawing you in? Cause I've tried, I've, I've tried to figure out what the alchemy is that makes that such a rad book. And I've listened to it twice now. Um, I, you know, I think it, in, it's funny that, that Andrew recommended, uh, uh, what if and, and Randall Monroe's, uh, way entertaining way of, of explaining complex problems that, you know, for, for me, the Martian, is it's like in the way that like if you watch the wire you're not really knowing you're not really understanding what the plight of the baltimore you know streets are right but you kind of feel like you know more about the plight of the baltimore streets and and the martian is kind of this this uh i feel like i know more about nasa and the spirit of 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 ingenuity and and never say die and and it is kind of this uh, at least up till the point that I'm I'm reading it, and I, I assume it will finish this way. Uh, this kind of love letter to the the uh, the the good and the ill of not only the the space program, but but NASA itself and the astronauts who who populate it. Um, but uh, it, it's good. It's really good. It's yeah. extremely well written, and I'll probably talk more about it when I finish it. Yeah, I, I, I suspect a big part of it is just the the uh, bright sunshine of. Uh, our protagonist's optimism, you know, even when things go bad, like, like by all rights, he should feel utterly defeated and broken at so many points of the book. And he just doesn't. And it's just, I, I love it. I, I, I aspire to be as, as good a person and as positive a, a vibe as he is. As Mark Watney. Uh, Mark Watney. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. I didn't want to access it. I didn't, Google wasn't listening on the watch and couldn't, you know, Mark Watney. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gentlemen, on an upcoming episode of Weird Things. This is so huge. We're going to reveal what happened right here when I sat in this chair. What? what emitting a fluid. Wait, we have to wait till a future episode? Wait, what? We're going to spend a week thinking you're, you were peeing during the show? I spit into a vial for a 23 in me DNA analysis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because they shut down 23 and Me in the U.S., but I guess it's open in, in no, they didn't England shut it now. down. They just can't give you a report as far as disease. Okay, but you can't, because I noticed now all the ads talk about, you know, that's 23andMe.co.uk, because if you live in the U.K., you can find out all this stuff. Yeah, but you can no, you can still do it here, and they'll do their ancestry. They won't tell you your genetic, like your what your disease is, what what might kill you, because so you know we can be protected by ignorance, I guess. I, but yes, you can find thing. out your ancestry. So I'm curious to find out. So I figured I'd do that. I'd recommend you guys do the same thing. We could all do these revelations of what are we? 
Well, I already got mine, bro. I, I did mine for for Ancestry dot com uh, for the for the Jury Moore podcast. Ashley and I both did it. Uh, which Ancestry dot com? Oh, a that's very right. Similar, right. It, it's a very similar process, but uh, they kind of their pitch is that already so many people have done it through them and have uh, traced their lineage that you find other distant genetic cousins mm -hmm. that have have also uh, you know used the same service or at least what they would assume based on. So this kind uh, of becomes like better. a Facebook thing where the most more people participate, the more valuable the search becomes, right? Yeah. Although I assume it, it's probably, I mean, the Andrews report will be will be fairly similar to to what I got, which is a bunch of percentages on on where my my parentage was, and and my maybe I should save my results. You can you can hear it on the Jury Moore podcast, but I'll, I'll save. There was a huge surprise uh, for my my genetic lineage that I had no idea about and was apparently fairly dominant. Oh man! All right, now I, I am gonna have to dive in on this. All right, I'll go ahead and sign up for it. Although I am, I do want to know all my diseases. I want to know what I'm gonna die of. Yeah, there's ways to take that data and then go to like uh, sites that will correlate and tell you that. Huh. So, gentlemen, it's been weird. Mm -hmm. Man, good show. That was really good. Uh, uh, um, what do we think of our title? Uh, oh, I think there's a showbot running. If you wanna, shoot it. Look at that. Uh, I think only I only saw one person vote in the show, but I saw a couple. But and I remember thinking as they came through, I remember thinking both of them were good. Uh, by the way, I hope I hope um, um, somebody was shouting at me, uh, Alistair. I hope you're watching right now. But uh, 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 the answer, uh, Alistair, is is those are great ideas, and I would love to, I would love to do all that stuff uh, in my infinite free time when I'm not. Yeah, Brian, why don't you cure cancer too? <laughs> when you, I'm not, do you like cancer? Why don't you <laughs> cure cancer? Why don't you become a cancer <laughs> researcher and cure cancer? Hi, Brian. I mean, when I'm not doing the Weird Things podcast, Night Attack, Cord Killers, hack, hacking the system, what was uh, scam school behind what, the scam? What, what what's that? What was the question? Oh, he says, why don't you talk about real scams like insurance fraud and, and, and you know, blah, blah, blah on scams. Brian, why don't you go to school, get a degree in economics and business administration, all that, so you can know what you're talking about and do that. Why don't you? I, I would love cancer. to. I, th I, think, I think those are, uh, I think it's a delightful idea, and, and in a different venue, I would do it. But scam school, man, it's like people are already yelling at me because I teach a, a, a clever matchstick math puzzle. They're like, this channel used to be about tricks, man. Now it's all just puzzles. <laughs> it's like... They they have the memory of a goldfish. Whatever it is this week is now now what it always is. Why was it a blah? It was like you mean like two weeks ago? Yeah. So there's that. Uh, okay, what are we calling it? That's the only thing about getting over a million followers, right? <laughs> memory like door. Or idiots. Uh, but there's also delightful people like Alistair there. Memory door. Uh, memory door. E door. Memory door. D o o r. Saved um, and dog on it. I I did not record locally for the video, but uh, I know that Leon has some way to grab that. So um, I'm sure there's a way. To by the way, it. Uh, have you heard kind of the the process by which he does that? It's actually like ingenious. No, what does he do? Like Leon doesn't even have to be anywhere to do it. He just has like a system set up that gets pinged whenever the CDN goes live and uh, auto caches and, everything. Yeah, auto auto records everything. That's fantastic. Yeah. So whenever we whenever we go live, there is somebody recording. A God, that thing has been a lifesaver so many times. Yeah, no. The first episode of Jermore that we did, we we uh, the the file corrupted, and luckily it was just sitting there on YouTube. Like I did uh, a Patreon for the 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 jury show, and the first like thirty episodes that I certainly did not record are all sitting there on on bbliveshow.com. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, all right, gentlemen, uh, I've got to race and see if we can beat the sunset so we can record these stand-ups uh, for Scam School. So I am going to bid you a fond adieu and resolve the evening to its tidings. Adios. Justin, right. may I Skype you, sir? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, he's, he wants to release more fluids. I hear you. Talk yeah. about right. You ain't fooling me. I'm out of here. So long, guys. <laughs> <laughs>